Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Music Den. I am, of course, your host, Armando Venditti. Hoping you guys are having a good Friday evening and that you're looking after yourselves and one another. We are back with our final episode of the top five albums of the 1980s. We are back with the year 1989. I am again joined by Mr. Bill Schuster. How are you, Bill, on this Friday evening? I am still surviving on no sleep, doing well, chugging right along. How about yourself? Doing well, doing well. I've complained in other episodes I need a tea, and I bloody well do right now. But Bob's <laughs> home yet. So so we will uh, push through. We will persevere and get through this. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a hell of a time doing these episodes of our Tough Hive albums of the 70s and the 1980s. This is our last episode of the 1980s. We are going to be taking a break for a bit on this topic, and then we're going to come back in a few weeks' time with our top five albums of the 1990s and 2000s. It's going to be a hell of a trip. Um, but for right now, we are concentrating on our top five albums of 1989. So as is customary with these episodes, we have picked our top five albums and two honorable mentions. So for the very last time, I will pass the virtual microphone. And it's a big one. Here we go. Over to Mr. Bill Schuster. There you go, Bill. Take. <laughs> testing, testing. Okay. It's a two-hander. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this one is an obscure, I, I guess you would call it country death metal. I guess. Okay. It's by an artist named Janet Jackson. It's oh my god. 14, 14. Okay, maybe I lied about the genre. I made some shit up there. Yeah. This thing was an absolute juggernaut. She was at this point in time after Control and this one about on a par with the success her brother was having. Which is pretty damned impressive. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. This had so many hit singles off of it, and they were all fun. They still are. This is state-of-the-art dance pop music, uh, 1989. You can't get any more, yeah, top-of-the-line stuff for 1989 than this. Yeah. And, of course, part of that's also due to Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, her uh, musical collaborators on this and Control. They work so well together. Kind of brings back shades of uh, Pete Blot, Giorgio Moroder working with Donna Summer back in the mm -hmm. 70s. So this is a whole different type of music. Uh, she's a little all over the map here. Of course, you know, she hits a bit of hard rock, even with Black Cat. Yeah. Uh, I, I like the fact that she was trying to uh, look into more of a, a social conscience a bit examining uh, social issues and political issues a little bit. Yeah, you mean and, on the track Living in a World We Did Not Make or something like that? The last Oh, time? yeah. And State of the World, The Knowledge, Rhythm Nation. It yeah. kind of it starts out with those more serious tracks, and then you have the interlude, Let's Dance After the Knowledge, which leads into Miss You Much, of course, which yeah. is not a big social conscience political type of song. It's... Mm -hmm. It's uh, basically the little interlude there was uh, get the message. Good. Let's dance. Like, OK, yeah. I've, I've said said my piece about this stuff for now. Let's party. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's really well done. There's a lot of those little interludes in here and yeah. they work well to tie the album together. Uh, yeah, all the hits. Rhythm Nation, Miss You Much, Love Will Never Do Without You, All Right, Escapade, Black Cat, Come Back to Me. I mean, it's ridiculous. This this is a radio playlist of, you know, 1989 and on into 90. Yeah, I know. I know. That was it. I had that. I have that on vinyl. Or I had that on vinyl. I think my nephew Michael has it now. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Um, I'd like to find a vinyl copy of it. I had it on cassette originally, but yeah. Yeah, that was back That was back when you could fit seven tracks on one side of an album. Okay. Um, I do remember the dance remixes of Escapade and All Right, done by Shep Pettibone. 
of Vogue fame. Um, and I love those remixes, those house mixes. It was amazing. Um, yeah, I miss you much. I really, I, I really don't miss that track at all myself, but uh, <laughs> that's a good choice. And if you guys hear my dogs barking in the background, I do apologize. Bob just came home with my dinner. But um, I digress. Okay, for me, my number five choice for 1989 is, again, with the Canadian contingent, Alana Miles with her self-titled debut album, uh, released on Atlantic Records. Um, Alana Miles, uh, I do believe she's a Toronto native. Uh, this album, when it came out, was a hit with songs like Love Is, Still Got This Thing, Lover of Mine, Black Velvet, which tore up the charts in America as well as Canada and in the UK. Um, song She worked with uh, a uh, Canadian songwriter, the uh, video jockey for much music named Christopher Ward, who wrote all of the album for her. Um, I call her kind of like uh, dance rock. Um, she, you know, it, it's it's dance music, like it's it's um, melodic pop music, dance music, but with a bit of a harder rock edge. Um, Still got this thing was one of my favorite tracks on the album, which starts off the album. Lover of Mine, which is a is a ballad, which I do believe ended off side one. Uh, a beautiful emotional track. Uh, Black Velvet. What else needs to be said about Black Velvet? Uh, other songs on the album are um, um, of note are Kickstart My Heart, which features uh, Del Bello on backing vocals at the time. Uh, if You Want To. Um, the final track on the album is like a bluegrass kind of track, uh, very acoustic based called Hurry Make Love. Uh, which is the one cover on the album. This thing was all over the Canadian charts. It was all over the American charts. Um, has it stood the test of time? Some of the tracks have, some of the tracks haven't. Unfortunately, Alana Miles has got, had some health issues uh, physically uh, these days, and she had to take on Atlantic Records because part of her deal with Atlantic meant that she could not re-record her album or make any good money off of her album uh, for something like 20 years after the release of the album due to the, the way the contract was stipulated. So uh, she's recently re-recorded Black Velvet to make money all on her own. Her last U.S. royalty check for the album was $5 million. That was back in 2007. So... When you sign these deals, guys, if you're a musician, read the fine print. Okay. Uh, that's my number five. Yeah. The Black Velvet is the only song I remember getting radio play here, but it got a lot of radio play on the rock stations. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. My number four, this is the second album by this band. Uh, I mentioned them in 1986 previously. It's Concrete Blonde with Free. At this point in time, uh, I, you know, no internet, blah, 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 very little info for magazines or anything like that. This is one of those things I didn't even know that Concrete Blonde was still a going concern. I thought they were just a one off. Uh, I had no information about them whatsoever other than I owned a copy of their first album on a cassette. And so when I saw this on cassette in the store, it blew my mind. I was like, yes, yes, yes. And I snapped it up and I played it to death. And combined with the first album, it made me a super fan. And they kind of became my pretty much my favorite current band of the late 80s and early 90s. They were my band then. And of course, this is before they had their hit album the following year with joy we may discuss uh when we get back to the 90s i'll just leave it there uh this 
God is a Bullet is probably the most famous song off this one. I remember that. Yeah, that's uh, another one. I, I seem to be smack talking cops in some of these songs here, but yeah, that's kind of what happens in this. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a high school grad. I'm over five foot three. I'll get a badge and a gun and I'll join the PD. Yeah. This, uh, for whatever reason on this album, they uh, added a fourth member. Johnette had previously been the bass player, but on here they added Alan Black on mm -hmm. bass. This is his only album. They reverted back to uh, Johnette, both singing and playing bass on the follow up and from there on out, which I think was a good call. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was their last album with Harry Rushkoff for a while before they replaced him with Paul Thompson on the next album. Mm -hmm. But of course, the core is always John at Napolitano on vocals and usually bass and James Mankey on his wonderful, unique guitar sound. You know, mm -hmm. James great. And this is the shirt I no longer own when I saw them in concert on the bloodletting tour. Uh, I got the shirt that had this image on it. And damn it. I've lost it years ago. I wish I still had that thing. But mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. this uh, they also do a cover of Thin Lizzy's It's Only Money on here. That was kind of a concrete blonde tradition. Each album would have one cover. The debut, they covered Beware of Darkness by George Harrison. And okay. they'd go on to cover you know, James Brown, Cheap Trick, and just Bob cool. Dylan. Cool. Um, there's a, a, a number of songs that hit me lyrically on here. There's one called Little Conversations in particular. That's basically about uh, feeling isolated in a crowd. And yeah, I pretty well related to that thoroughly at this time. So I kind of felt I was picking up what Johnette was putting down here. I still yeah. relate to that. And I'm 53. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, if you liked, most people, if you know them at all, you're going to know Bloodletting, the follow-up, and yeah, as you said, the, the hit, Joey. But uh, if you like that, it's well worth going back, checking out the previous two, and the ones that came after, they were definitely not just a one-album wonder. Yeah. No, and it's a good choice. You got me wanting to go check out bloody Joe Jackson again and Concrete Blonde. Bloody. You and um, I are going to go, you know what? The IRS label again, by the way. There Sorry. You go. Ladies and gentlemen, when Bill and I do a meet of, uh, at some point in person, we are going to go shopping. We're going to leave Bob and Stacy having a coffee somewhere. And we're going to go shopping. We're going to come back with bucketfuls of CDs. And they're both going to kick us out of the house. <laughs> that's how much we inspire one another in terms of buying albums. Um, just be forewarned. Okay, um, my have to save up, <laughs> save up. Oh, I know, <laughs> I know. I'll just use Bob's credit card. Um, <laughs> my number four is XTC with oranges and lemons. This is their follow up to uh, Skylarking in '87. Uh, this is this has been called their their Sgt. Pepper album just because of the arrangements on some of the tracks. Uh, the the lead off the the lead off single from the album, a simple little track, Mayor Simpleton, um, which is a beautiful love song. Uh, the I think the lead off lyric goes, "Never had a paper or a learning degree." You know what I mean? He's basically saying to his girlfriend. He doesn't have much to give. He's not that intelligent. And he doesn't even, he never claimed to be. All he knows is he loves her. Okay? How much more simple can you get than that? Do you know what I mean? Uh, fantastic, simple little pop track. And when I say simple, I don't mean in terms of the arrangements. I just mean the statement behind it. The lead-off track, Garden of Earthly Delights. This is where they go into their Eastern Arabic psychedelic um kind of vibe which is fantastic 
Um, other songs of note are King for a Day and uh, The Loving. Um, on the track on drums you uh, are is featured Pat Mastelato. Uh, I believe I said this last name right. Who played with Mr. Mister and will go on to play with uh, King Crimson until they uh, finally disbanded. So that's my number four choice. Sorry, I didn't mean to appear. I was uh, not listening. My, I was. You were uh, checking the connection. Yes, <laughs> it was uh, starting to act up. So. <laughs> okay, we're gonna get through this. Number three. Okay. Uh, number you were number four. <laughs> yeah. I do remember actually, oddly enough, uh, Mayor of Simpleton getting play on. Uh, one of the rock stations around here back then it doesn't seem like track that would really necessarily fit on what was going on at that time so in hindsight it's kind of surprising it got radio play on that format yeah it's a good track though yeah no it is it's good all right my number three i talked about this band on the previous year but this is their most famous album it's the pixies with Doolittle. Um, yeah, this is where they really refined their sound. They sharpened their pop hooks, but they were still weird as it gets. Mm -hmm. And Black Francis was still capable of the uh, blood curdling screams. Uh, I mean, it starts off with Debaser with that. God. What a be a Debaser? And then. In the background, you got Kim Deal, the D baser with her lovely uh, callback vocals. It's it's great. Mm -hmm. then, the next track is Time, where he really gets, yeah, gets mm -hmm. with it. And the third track, Wave of Mutilation. With a title like that, you'd think it would be some brutal metal punk type thing, but it's really just a uh, kind of a catchy pop tune. Yeah. I'll sail away on a wave of mutilation. Wave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's hooks galore on here amidst all this weirdness. Uh Here Comes Your Man is uh one of the more popular songs, I guess. It was used in one of the old singing video games we had that was kind of weird and fun singing along with the Pixies, along with uh, you know, Stacy and the kids. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually a catchy pop song. It frankly could have been a hit if I think if it had really been pushed in the proper markets, it would have been weird and cool to have the Pixies actually have a hit single. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they didn't really need a hit single. Uh, they were quite unique and still are. There's nobody quite like them, no matter how Kurt Cobain tried. And I think he pretty well kind of admitted that himself. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Pixies do little absolutely masterpiece album. Uh, nothing quite like it at this time or any other. Cool. Cool. It's a good pick. Um, my number three, ladies and gentlemen, we must carry on is the cult with Sonic Temple. Um, and this is a follow-up to their massively successful electric album. Uh, their first album to be produced by Bob Rock, who would go on to produce four more of their albums. Uh, last one being um, Hidden City in 2016. Uh, by the way, I have all the albums. Um, big surprise. Um, you know, featuring the, you know the track, the lead-off single, Fire Woman. Uh, other singles were my favorite track is Edie, Child Baby, just amazing, heavy drumming. Um, and people would think that because Matt Sorum that would go on later, go on to be in Guns N' Roses and Velvet Revolver, that he recorded the drums for the album. A little brief uh, history. Eric Singer of Kiss fame did um, the demo recordings for the album. The original demo had 14 tracks on the album. The second set of demos which featured uh, Chris Taylor of Bob Rock's band at the time, um, featured 15 tracks. But no, the person who recorded the drums for these uh, for this album is Mickey Curry of Hall & Oates fame and Brian Adams fame. Uh, yes. And he does some bloody amazing heavy drumming on this uh, album. Just amazing. Other songs of note. First of all, I love... 
um, uh, Billy Duffy's guitar tone. Just a wall of guitar sound. Just lush and textured and har harmony all over the place. Bloody amazing. Ian Asprey's vocals, pardon my language, fucking forget about it. Just over the top. Harmonies galore. Um, other songs of note are uh, Sun King, which starts off the album, and Sweet Soul Sister, which was another single. But for me, Edie Child Baby, done. That could have sold the album for me. But I digress. So that is my number three. All right. You are definitely giving some love to the cult. Oh, sorry, getting the tramp. <laughs> it's this is the real stuff, folks. We, the real uh, behind the scenes action here. <laughs> if we're for anything, every, if we are anything, ladies and gentlemen, we're authentic. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. As I pick myself up <laughs> or attempt to. All right. Uh, my number two is, uh, it was tempting to make it my number one. I'm still almost thinking about it, but not quite. Uh, once upon a time, back in 1989, I had a, a very long distance relationship with a young lady named Chris. Uh, she lived about an hour away and I had no car. So we rarely saw each other, but one thing came out of this odd and short relationship, and it was the self-titled album from Indigo Girls that she introduced me to the first time I rode in her car with her. The Indigo Girls, this album absolutely just gobsmacked me when I got into it. They've, I know critics gave them a lot of criticism for their lyrics on this album, saying it sounded like a bunch of... Uh, a college freshman uh yeah it, it basically they were belittling and insulting the lyrics on here saying that they were kind of shallow kid lyrics essentially but yeah i disagree still again at almost 56 these lyrics a lot of them still speak to me I, yeah so those critics can get wrecked as far as i'm concerned they were wrong and go. the way that Amy and Emily's voices work together. They blend perfectly. Amazing. They contrast each other. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I typically find myself drawn to Emily's songs on this particular album more than Amy's, but Amy's songs are great too and they work well together. Um, Closer to Fine is probably the most well known song on here and yeah. it, it's brilliant. But I, I think my favorite is Prince of Darkness. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. Someone's got his finger on the button in some room. Yeah, no one can convince me we aren't gluttons for our doom. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's really a lovely album. It's uh, it has a guest appearance by one Michael Stipe. He got around. Uh, he also uh, gave Concrete Blonde their band name. His IRS label mates. So yeah. Lots of intertwining connections here between some of these artists at this point in time. Yeah, Stipe got around back in those days. You know? Yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is, you know, basically two women in their uh, guitars. Uh, absolutely brilliant album. I wouldn't trade a song off this album. Mm -hmm. it, it, it really, really is a hair from being my number one, but there's probably only one thing that could have kept it from being number one we'll get there yeah good choice they also do a guest on um pink's album um i'm not dead yeah I'm dear mr president that's right and for anybody out there danielle smith premier of alberta i'm talking to you listen to the lyrics really listen to the lyrics moving on they also, uh, uh, on that note, they also guested on Mary Chapin Carpenter's uh, super successful Come On, Come On album a few years later. There you go. There you go. There you go. You froze there for just a few. Ah. There we go. Okay. 
There we go. All right. We must carry on, ladies and gentlemen. My number two is from a band I have not mentioned at all thus far, and it's The Cure with Disintegration. Um, the Cure are a very peculiar band. You either like them or you just, or you love them or you don't have any time for them. This album for me, um, it's a very layered, textured, heavy album. Um, <laughs> the main single that I remember from this album is Fascination Street. And it's a very, it's, it, it, it almost, the album almost borders on gothic rock. I mean, um, that's what the Cure are basically known for. But this album, more than anything else, uh, it's a very heavy guitar laden album. Again, very heavy drums, heavy bass, fantastic bass work. Uh, but, but uh, Fascination Street, um, is uh, the one song that is like a wall of guitar and keyboard textures that kind of uh, prop the band up on and on, on the track. Um, again, heavy drums, uh, and again Robert Smith with the the hair at the time and the 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 makeup, the you know the the brooding lips and the whole heavy eye black make eye black make uh, black eye makeup. Sorry, it's been one of those days, guys. The album is great. Songs like uh, Plain Song. Uh, Pictures of You, Love Song, which is another single, Lullaby, another single. Again, Fascination Street, Homesick. The the album has a has a theme about it where he's basically saying, without saying it, that he's reached his limit of creativity. He doesn't know how much more he can give to the band, to himself, to the public, but most importantly to himself. And he is quite scared about it, but he's also resigned himself to it. So will there be another album after Disintegration? Yes, there would be. 1992's Wish, I do believe. But at this point, he was wondering, should he pack it in in terms of the cure? Um, it is great. It's a fantastic album. I, you know, I really didn't think I'd like it as much as I did. I did an episode on an album spotlight on this album. Not many people saw it. Please check it out. Please do. Um, but it is melodic. It is heavy. It is textured. Um, some amazing guitar work on it. And I really do believe that you should give it more of a, of a listen. Disintegration from The Cure. Number two. Yeah, they're... I'm I'm not really in the the love the cure or hate the cure camp. I liked them. I like uh, the singles I've heard here and there, and I like the albums that I've listened to. But I've never fully deep dived in their catalog or uh, fully embraced them. They're kind of one of those in between bands for me. They're cool, but yeah, yeah, I know. Let, yeah. Take them or leave them, right? Pretty much. Gotcha. <laughs> Well, after as much as I talked about how much I love that Indigo Girls album, what, or shall we say, who could possibly be good enough to beat the Indigo Girls? Oh, my goodness. Ah, you knew it had to be Joe all Jackson. These, <laughs> all these hints. All these hints. It's Blaze of Glory. As Joe's commercial star was definitely waning by the late 80s. He was pretty well all out of hits at this point. But he was definitely not out of creativity. Uh, this is an absolutely freaking brilliant album. That's It's another one, you know, back in the days of I didn't hear anything on radio. Had no idea it was coming out. I just went to a store and bam, there was Joe Jackson, Blaze of Glory on cassette staring at me. And again, pure excitement. Let's go and... For those who saw our 87 episode and my initial disappointment with his previous album, Willpower, well, this one, there was no initial disappointment. This is more what I was expecting, but still new, still different, still exploring different ad ad avenues. Uh, Tomorrow's World is a, a great start. It's a little duet. 
and so uh, it talks about hey remember that spaceship they blasted into god knows where yeah left all the bach music in or put all the bach music in left all the shit behind the <laughs> or joe's little funny pretentious kind of line there yeah. uh yeah I believe Down to London was the single, but I sure as hell never heard it. Not at all on the radio. Uh, this has, uh, one of the things Joe does is he gets his ego out of the way sometimes and lets other people sing his songs. And that's the case on Sentimental Thing, which it's quite nice. And the vocalist sounds enough like Joe. And that's followed by Acro Acropolis Now, which is a rocking instrumental the only instrumental on the album, and it leads right into the title track, Blaze of Glory, which is kind of your traditional rock star. Think of Shooting Star by Bad Company, that kind of thing. You know, we created this big star, and here's what happened. And when he mm -hmm. faded away. Uh, but side two overall is my favorite. He starts out rant and rave, starts getting political, then goes into 19 Forever, which is one of my favorite joe songs and uh, well, you can tell by the title he it's about aging he says yeah. in, in there i'm i'm never going to be 35 and only my mirror sees me crying and mm. yeah uh, obviously joe's a lot more than 35 now and so am i so, <laughs> so yeah. uh, the best i can do is mm. a nice just a nice heartfelt love song that he has plenty of when he wants to. Yeah. Evil Empire is one of my favorite political lyrics from Joe. It plays into the whole Cold War that was still going strong at the time and unfortunately is back again. Like it never went away between uh, the United States and at that time the Soviet Union, now Russia. But uh, it did a little play on the whole evil empire thing where it turns out he was saying it, it sounds as though he might be talking about something else, but it turns out the United States was the evil empire in the spoiler alert in this. Yeah. yeah. You, yeah. Yeah, it talks about, uh, you can't kill innocents abroad and run, uh, but if you're good at it, we might ask, come on over to the other side kind of shades of the United States, bringing the Nazis over after world war two to work on, the space program among other things and, yeah. mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if you're of a certain political bent you might really dig evil empire if you're not you might really hate it i'll just mm -hmm. put it there but okay. it's a powerful song uh, discipline kind of gets into this more i don't want to say techno but it kind of pre-techno kind of very electronic beat and uh, it leads right into the last song, which is just the opposite of that, called The Human Touch, which is another nice, simple, powerful love song. Uh, but all these songs are kind of connected together on the album. There's no space in between. I like that with an album. I like yeah, that. One. Me too. Yeah, I got to get that too. You got to give me that list, man. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. Great album. But Still one of my favorite Joe Jackson albums. It's uh a big fan favorite amongst hardcore fans, but not a lot of success uh, commercially necessarily. So. But it's my number one. Cool. Cool. There goes my bank account. Um, that's a good choice. Ladies and gentlemen, my number one choice for 1989 is, is Bill Trex's connection um, is Queen with the Miracle. Um, I started 1980 with Queen as number one. I'm going to end the 1980s with Queen as my number one. Now, let me set this up for you. Uh, I look at the miracle as a hybrid between the game and hot space because you had funk oriented tracks like Party, which starts off the album with its treated drums. And if you want to hear the original version of Party, you can go on YouTube and you can look up the uh, reissue uh, release of The Miracle. But it starts off with Party with the treated drums, funk guitar, which Brian May does some killer guitar on Party. Uh, then it goes into Khashoggi Ship, which is more of a rocking track. Um, and the rock tracks are the... Um, 
my God, I want it all, the lead-off single in America, uh, Scandal, which is a bit more of a rocking track, which the band themselves do not like. I know Roger Taylor hates that track completely. Uh, another fantastic track on the album is um, Was It All Worth It? So base, uh, I'll just, hold on a second. You have songs like Party, uh, Breakthrough, uh, The Invisible Man, which are the more funk, pop-oriented tracks. You have songs like uh, I Want It All, uh, Scandal, um, uh, the instrumental track that was on the CD version, Chinese uh, Torture, um, which are more the rock-oriented tracks. So you have, it's that kind of a combination. The reason why I have it as... My number one is I listened to this album when it first came out at Agnosium. I give Queen kudos, I have to say that slowly, because of what they were trying to do. Um, were they there yet in terms of a rock album? No, they were not there yet. Um, uh, Roger Taylor said Innuendo was a lot like The Miracle, except a lot less poppy which I would I would agree, but we're not in the 90s yet. The Miracle for me, as I said, was a good combination of what the funk side was of Hot Space and what the rock portion was of the game. You put that together, and in my opinion, very humble opinion, you have The Miracle. Plus the fact that when you look at the cover art, you have all four faces or four heads of the band together, which meant that even before I even saw the credits, I knew that that meant that all the, all the tracks were credited to Queen as an ensemble, not individually, okay? To me, if they had released, for example, was it all worth it? You know, as a single, that would have went crazy. Number one, the album suffered from lack of promotion from Capitol, because at that point, Capra were ready to throw them out the window. Okay? When their manager approached them in 1990 to buy back the catalog, they basically gave it to them. Here, take it. We don't want it anymore. Okay? When the album was released, it hit number 49 on the charts. Should it have done better? Yes, it should have. Why didn't it do better? I have no bloody idea. But it's still a good album. So that is my number one. Queen the Miracle. I've always really liked that cover. I've heard a lot of people smack talk. Really cool. I think it's a really powerful visual. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted all that. Yeah, that track got absolutely played to death on the rock station around here, and it sounded yeah. great. It, uh, yeah, it did. It still does. I mean, that's a classic kick-ass just rocking queen to yeah, yeah it is so i don't know why that audience upon hearing that single didn't say hey let's go buy this album here queen yeah but yeah i can't figure that out either i i think i think it had to do quickly i think it had to do with the lack of promotion from capital and also the yeah. fact that um Freddie mercury at that time didn't want it to couldn't tour anymore and um that's a fair point yeah so so anyways um your first honorable mention before we lose your connection again <laughs> all right uh this Let's start my right first one's the only one i don't, don't have a prop for in 1989 uh, had it on cassette go figure uh it's the sugar cubes with their second album here today tomorrow next week uh, for those who don't know you might know Bjork, but this is where, uh, yeah, this is her band prior to her popular solo career in the 90s and well up till now. Uh, she here shares the vocals with, I believe, uh, the guy's name is Einar, Einar, I believe it's like E I N A R. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce last names or anything here. Uh, if you've never heard the Sugar Cubes, well, yeah, Bjork's solo weirdness will give you a clue, but really the the 
combination of the the male female vocals is what makes this band yeah they are both so freaking weird and unique and hilarious there is nothing quite like the sugar cubes uh yeah but they can write pop hooks too like uh tidal wave is one of my favorite songs of here here comes the tidal wave mm-hmm. but it, there's even one point where uh bjork kind of plays it straight and she's kind of the sultry seductress on a song called pump where she invites you to eat me love what swallow me all of me what okay well that's a little more straightforward than some of your other odd lyrics there all right there you go yeah it's like yeah. <laughs> it's like but, we just met go on no he also yeah but they, these guys they're they're just they were just a fun weird band yeah um, regina is another song that uh, is one of my favorites off here it but really the whole album's a blast it's well worth checking out if you're looking for something unusual or if you've never if you're a bjork fan who's never gone back to her earlier days you gotta check out the sugar cubes so yeah here today tomorrow next week there's an exclamation point at the end of the title if you didn't notice no i noticed that okay I noticed that. I didn't think you were doing it that for your health. You know what I mean? So um, <laughs> that's a good choice. Uh, my first honorable mention is Pat Metheny with Letters from Home. Um, I just love Pat Metheny's guitar playing. I think this whole album is just a very relaxing, tranquil uh, adventure, you know, with his guitar work. He can just sort of soothe you. With this, with this playing, um, and there really are no tr- tracks that really stand out for me. It's just that this album is just a fantastic piece of work. So uh, short and sweet, but that's my answer. And you know, so, Pat Metheny letters from home. You're making me want to dig into Pat Metheny much more than I have as, as many times as you're mentioning his albums. That's uh, yeah. You're welcome. All right, my, my last one, uh, I've been trying to, uh, mostly in this series, I've been trying to stick with my original list and not change things, but even though I had this particular list complete probably two or three weeks ago, I changed it today about an hour before we started recording our first episode of the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kicked off uh, my boys from Canada and their Presto album for this. It's Don Henley with The End of the Innocents. I, I realized how much i loved this album and played it to death and how much the best songs on here are still absolutely kick-ass timeless tracks uh yeah uh, there's still it, it's really the rockers are are still cool but they're a bit more dated but it's really those hit ballads they're all absolutely freaking brilliant uh the bruce hornsby track which is the title track the end of the innocence is absolutely gorgeous and lyrically it's wonderful i mean this is some of don's best lyrics ever on this album uh new york minute is wow the wolf is always at your door you bet you know you find somebody to love in this world you better hang on tooth and nail the wolf is always at your door in a new york minute everything can change that just things there's so many just yeah there's just some really powerful songs on here. Uh, and of course the last worthless evening is just quite a lovely. Uh, yeah. I want to love you. Let me love you kind of song. Let me, uh, yeah. Let me make it better. You. Let me but show course, you that it is possible. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the big one of all those ballads is still the heart of the matter. That's one of my all time favorite songs. It's just, it's a powerful message. That's one of those songs that uh, frankly helped me get through my divorce uh, a few years after this album came out. Uh, it, it was a pretty powerful message. I mean, yeah, uh, related to a lot of the lyrics. And then, of course, the key point is that forgiveness. That's that's the whole thing. You know, move beyond all your petty. Yeah, I think it's also. Yeah, sorry. Go on. Go on. Yeah. It, I think it's also about uh, forgiveness of self. Yeah, valid point. Yeah, it's it's it still remains a powerful song, and 
even if I didn't like the rest of the album, that song alone is definitely one of those songs that would elevate the album enough to put it in here. So yeah, once I really thought about it today, sorry, Rush, I had to kick you to the curb. Don Henley had to uh, get his due here. Yeah. And, and this is another one of those, this was a monster success. Not quite on par with uh, Janet Jackson album that I started my countdown with tonight yeah. on this episode, but still there are a ton of songs got played on the radio and not just those four hit ballads i mean the rock stations were playing give me what you got i will not go quietly how bad do you want it and if dirt were dollar so we're talking between those four rockers and the four more ballady songs that is eight tracks out of the 10 on this album that i was hearing regularly on the radio that's impressive yeah yeah so yeah look at look at his goofy ass hairdo there look at that little is that dated or what his uh, little he almost looks like Corey feldman there <laughs> pretty much pretty much <laughs> pretty much Luckily, the music is better than don's cover picture pretty much um that's a good choice ladies and gentlemen my last honorable mention is don henley with end of the innocence <laughs> um <laughs> i could not I don't know what else to put to, to mention except for the fact that um, songs like uh, The Heart of the Matter and New York Minute. First of all, New York Minute fucking knocked me out of my chair to the point where I was like in tears, crying listening to this um, because you realize he's right lyrically he's right and you don't know what's going to happen around the corner hell I crossed the street one night and I got hit by a car in my chair you know what I mean so um, ladies and gentlemen you never know what's going to happen in your life. So if you are in a good situation or basically enjoy what you are doing now, if you are in something that you're or doing something that you enjoy or you're in a happy situation or a happy relationship or a good relationship or a good state of mind in your life, enjoy what you have and just relish it, Yeah, which is basically what he's saying. You know, um, and I mean, the other songs like the Tower Track with, you know, Bruce Hornsby. I mean, Bruce Hornsby's production is all over that track. The piano, the drums. I mean, I was thinking, is this Don Henley or is this the way it is from Bruce Hornsby? You know what I mean? Um, oh, you hear those lyrics. <laughs> exactly. You know. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, the heart of the matter. Come on. You know, I mean, him, somebody coming to terms with a, a, an ending of the ending of a relationship, whether or not whose ever fault it was, my fault, your fault, a mutual agreement that we both screwed up. And the one person finally going, coming to the point of realization, like, okay. I get it. We're done. I have to go. I have to move on. You have to go. We have to live our lives separately. That is hard. That is gut-wrenching to some people. And to some people, it's impossible. But he says at the end, he basically saying it with the song, he's saying it is possible to do. And you have to do it. So those lyrical, uh, like those lyrics and th that message behind the lyrics, that is some powerful shit. You know what I mean? So I mean the the duet with Axl Rose, notwithstanding, it's the, one of the more weaker tracks in the album, uh, but the album is a good album. So it is for that reason that it is an honorable mention. So. So there you go, guys.
Our top five albums of 1989. Pretty strong year. Hmm? Sorry? It's a pretty strong year. There you go. Oh, very much. Very much so. So, guys, with our top five albums of the 70s and our top five albums of the 80s, we have come to the conclusion of this series for the time being. We will be back in a few weeks. You've been forewarned with, <laughs> with our top five albums of the 90s and, and the 2000s. So, but for the top five albums of 1989, we want to thank you guys for watching these episodes. We've enjoyed putting them together. We've enjoyed all of your input. So please, don't let us stop you for this episode. Please, down there in the comments below, put your top five albums or top 10, top two, top three, and an honorable mention or two for 1989. Okay? Again, there are no right or wrong answers. Just different opinions. All right? So, for Mr. Bill Schuster, before I say goodnight, would you like to add anything to this experience? How you felt about it? It's been a blast, really. I mean, uh, it, this was quite a bit different in the 70s. Uh, overall, the choices in the 80s were a little easier. There, there weren't quite as many in some years as there were all throughout the 70s, but there's still a lot of great music throughout the 80s here. Yeah. It's it's been fun to just the whole experience, even even without the whole recording and doing these shows and everything. To me, you know, being a music nerd, I just had fun simply ranking these things, going through and all right, where would I put this? Do do I really like this one better? I mean, it was just a fun mental exercise. And that's cool, you know? and yeah, and for me, I I found it a sifting experience, like because you go back and you look and you realize what you listened to back in the day and you think, okay, in some cases. In other cases, you're thinking, what the hell was I thinking? Like, what was I doing? You know, like, I mean, no. <laughs> so um, it, it was a good exercise for that alone. So, so uh, guys, from this... Uh, Start again. <laughs> again, been a long day, guys. Um, we want to thank you for watching these episodes. I want to sincerely thank Mr. Bill Schuster. He's not going anywhere, guys. I just want to thank him very much for giving me this. Idea. Oh, he's gone now. I spoke too soon. I want to thank Mr. Bill Schuster for giving me this idea to do these shows. And I want to thank him for uh, co-hosting with me and basically co-piloting the ship. And um, and uh, coming up with some good ideas and good uh, album choices. So for now, we will bid you a good night. And um, we will see you soon with another episode for another show. Another idea. That's a threat. Whole, whole other idea for a new, ep new show. New idea. Okay. And we'll be back in a few weeks with top five albums of the 90s, okay? So for Mr. Bill Schuster, I am Armand Vinditi, wishing you a good evening, and uh, please look after yourselves and one another, and we will see you soon with another episode. Bye for now.